This talk explains how to separate mixtures of files using the Dowker complex and some order theory and statistics. This is joint work with a number of collaborators at BAE Systems, as well as several students of mine. Data in this talk has been provided as part of the DARPA Safe Docs project and funding as well from the DARPA Safe Docs project. The question is, uh, what do we mean when an ad hoc file format like PDF or CSV that doesn't have a formal specification, what does that mean when that has multiple dialects? We want to find these dialects in a way that is both accurate and easily explainable. Accurate models have to fit the data, and explainable models should be parsimonious. They should not take excessive amount of description and should be relatively easy to understand. Of course, since these files can also contain malware, we don't want to risk damaging our computers if possible. And while security is not really a main part of my particular uh, part of this project, it's actually kind of useful to imagine that we've limited the input and output for a parser that can read files uh, so that it simply can give us uh, a set of messages. Either the message occurred or it didn't for each file. You could store this in a tabular data format called a binary relation in which files elicit messages from different parsers. The general hypothesis, which turns out to be true, is that an ensemble of many parsers and many messages should be generally more reliable than a single parser. So hopefully the features that we would like to find to classify the files will be visible in this kind of data structure. <coughs> now, the data in here is kind of inscrutable in a sense. Uh, so here are two of these matrices. Uh, they're roughly 1,000 by 10,000 uh, matrices. So they're shown as images here. Uh, in which on the left are ostensibly safe files and on the right are ostensibly uh, dangerous files, a little ominous. Uh, these are PDF files, so each column in both of these uh, consist of uh, or correspond to files. Uh, each row corresponds to uh, different kinds of messages produced on the standard error stream for various parsers. The rows are the same for both, the columns are not. And you might immediately say, hey, I can't see much of a difference between the safe and the dangerous files. And of course, that's what the malware authors want. The idea here is if I grab a single column, uh, each of the rows correspond to different kinds of messages. So here are several. And even though this particular file generated a whole bunch of messages, some of them appear to be errors, uh, the file was manually deemed to be valid and safe. Uh, the Karadoc parser in particular is known to throw many harmless errors. When we've looked at many different data sets, especially even though the one we were just looking at, but especially others as well, uh, there are really only two kinds of messages that tend to occur. Those that happen very frequently and those that are more sporadic and random. Uh, the tactic is to threshold messages into two classes based on their frequency. Uh, the, these classes of uh, messages differ for different classes of files. And you might say, well, all right, what do you mean the files are not random, are they? Well, no, the programs aren't random, but the contents can be thought of as random. Given this idea, we can write out a probabilistic model uh, in which you could ask, what's the probability that a, a file of class A exhibits a set of messages K? Uh, given our thresholded message probabilities, this is pretty easy if we assume the messages are independent once we've conditioned upon class. Uh, and so what's up on, on the slide is a product of a bunch of Bernoulli random variables, uh, one for each message. The message either occurred or it didn't. And there's two kinds of messages, those that are more frequent and those that are less. And I do want you to hold the assumption about independence in your mind, but let's just go with it for a moment. If you take this model, uh, of course, the, the thing you can do is you can take the model and you can use Bayes' rule uh, to turn this into an easy classifier. Uh, if you estimate the, the, class prob or the message pattern probability from the class probability, uh, you could do very well. Uh, if, if you don't have that information, you can bootstrap and still do reasonably well. Uh, of course, the, the state of the art otherwise would be just to simply say that a file is bad if it throws too many errors. Uh, you can see from the precision and recall plots, the area under the curve is, is uh, not so great for that case, and much better if you have a good data set to build from. Now, that pesky independence assumption, uh, you could say, well, all right, is it really true? 
There's actually a statistical test for independence. The classic chi-squared seems to apply here. Uh, of course, there are a lot of chi-squareds you need to run for all of these different messages. Uh, not so hard to see that, that this tends to work. In this particular data set, the good files are basically the messages are independent, whereas the bad files, they're not entirely. Uh, it seems to hold. Independence seems to hold. But there are some notable cases where it doesn't. Uh, and those cases are actually important. The failure of independence suggests that there are actually multiple classes, not just good and bad files. So given that, let's try to build a mixture of classes uh, where, there, where there's some overlapping that's possible. You can see a file of a given, uh, two different files of different classes can elicit the same set of messages. Uh, this, is, this is a classic independent mixture model. There's a huge literature for inferring what the, the classes are from the data, effectively what this amounts to is saying, uh, I, if I assume that the classes are disjoint, a file is only in one class, uh, and while that might be a somewhat limiting, it, it seems to work. Uh, there's huge literature for this. Uh, unfortunately, this latent class analysis is fairly slow to converge. It relies on expectation maximization, uh, and it usually requires knowing how many classes are present to begin with. Of course, we, we said, well, there's good and bad files, and then found that was, wasn't right. Uh, so that's, that's a problem. Uh, and, and much more frustrating to me is that when I tried to use some of the state-of-the-art latent class analysis tools, uh, I found out that they really only could handle patterns that had two features at a time, two messages at a time. Uh, and, and as you might imagine, I was a little bit annoyed because I have several thousand messages to deal with, and multiple messages occur at any, any given instance. So uh, we kind of need to go back to the drawing board if we want to solve this problem. So let's retreat back to the data and search uh, for some insight. Here's a much smaller data set. Uh, this is a data set drawn uh, from comma-separated value files, CSV files. Of course, they're very common. You imagine, how, how hard can this be, right? It's got commas, it's got values, and at the end of each line, you've got a new line character, and it's a table, right? Should be easy. Well, it isn't exactly. Uh, so again, the columns are files. There's 3,000 roughly files in this data set. Uh, and there's about two dozen different messages or features. So there are delimiters, variants for commas, if you will. There are different kinds of encodings. How do you write the characters? Uh, and there's a bunch of different quote characters and escape characters to manage uh, when you want to include a delimiter in a data field. And as you can see, there's quite the variety of message patterns. Certainly more than two of them occur at any given time. It's quite a mixture. And most of the CSV files are just as you'd expect. Uh, the top few classes, the top six classes here, are in fact comma-separated values with different encodings. And sometimes they have quotes, sometimes they don't. Uh, some of them are not, though. Uh, who in their right mind thought that tab is a comma? Uh, well, in the Microsoft world, tab apparently is comma. This is due to Microsoft Excel. Uh, so you might say, well, gosh, I guess there are different dialects of CSV files that are present in this data set. Okay. Now, under that statistical model, you can prove a nice little theorem that says if, the, if each of the messages don't occur that frequently, they occur less than 50% of the time. And of course, if they occur more than 50% of the time, that's fairly benign. You can just invert the message. Uh, then as you add more messages, they should be less frequent. So for instance, if I take a look at the message pattern consisting of ASCII encoded comma separated files, there's uh, 1,417 of them. And if I add quotes to the list, the number goes down to 682. This is a, a factor or a result of the independence assumption. And you can kind of think of this as by saying message counts vary because the file contents vary randomly. Of course, they're not like varying randomly. They're varying ran uh, in sort of a, in a funny way. They're varying randomly because we've drawn a random sample out of this, the set of all possible such files. Cool. That's what the file. The, that's what the the uh, statistical model says. Independence yields. Great. We already know that independence doesn't hold in the PDF case. It also doesn't hold here. There are violations to monotonicity, which necessarily mean that. Uh, there are violations to independence. So if we take the UTF-8 encoded comma separated files, there's 119 of them. And if we add quotes, you actually get more files, 196. Uh, so there's a good reason for this. Files are not random. They have structure. And as it turns out, UTF-8 is a newer uh, encoding. And people have become more careful about quoting fields in, uh, in CSV files. And so uh, this is kind of a, a feature of uh, format specification drift. 
Now, you could actually lay out the message patterns, uh, not just in a table, but in a partial order, uh, ordered by inclusion. Uh, so in this graph that I've drawn here, uh, the vertices of this directed graph are the distinct message patterns. They're sized by vert, uh, file counts. You can see the size of the vertices are bigger or smaller. Uh, and there is an, an, an edge between them if, uh, if one message pattern includes in the other. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the Dalker complex will recognize this as the face order for the Dalker complex. Here are the ASCII files. Let's just focus our attention on those. Uh, it's a pretty nice connected subset. And uh, if I highlight the places where violations to monotonicity occur, I kind of suggest that places where, the, where this occurs is, is actually a different dialect. So comma-separated ASCII is somehow a different dialect from space-separated ASCII or semicolon-delimited ASCII. Uh, you don't tend to use spaces and commas to delimit fields within a CSV file. So you could say, well, all right, any message pattern that contains one of these monotonicity violations could be part of that same dialect. And what I've drawn here, effectively, then, is an open cover in the Alexandrov topology for the Dalker complex. Uh, the whole set is included as well in this open cover, uh, but I haven't shown it for just so that things don't get too cluttered. And so you could say, well, all right, the minimal set of messages in each dialect characterize it in some sense, comma-separated ASCII, for instance. Uh, and that's required for you to be in that dialect. Of course, don't assume that, uh, that that comma and ASCII means you have a CSV file, because you could have non-tabular data. OK, so the dialect consists at least of some files that produce comma and ASCII. Now, ambiguity is present in uh, these file format specifications, since there's no actual specification. We want some accuracy. We want to match the distribution of files, ultimately. Uh, and so you could imagine a, a finer or a coarser decomposition into dialects. So here's a finer one with more dialects, and here's a coarser one with fewer. Effectively, the topology, the open cover involved, matters. The one that's shown here is the coarsest one that's still consistent with the data. And it turns out, as a result, it's easiest to explain because there's just simply less to explain. OK, so let's go back to our statistical model. Here's our independent mixture model again. Uh, let's improve it. And really, the key insight we had was that we wanted to, uh, to set a, a, a class-required feature set. You need comma and ASCII to be in the comma ASCII dialect. Once you've done that, then everyone else, all the other features, become independent. So independence occurs not only when you're conditioned on dialect, but also after the required features have occurred. So you'll notice the, the feature variables have to equal one within the required set. Otherwise, the likelihood that you're in that dialect is zero. OK, so we can relax the problem even a little bit further to make this solvable. Uh, and by way of recognizing that the moment we've asked for independence, we're in the expectation maximization world. When we've asked for these required features, we now would have just say, well, all right, any kind of monotonically decreasing function should bound the class counts, and that's probably quite sufficient. So we can rewrite the, the, the sum as being, instead of a sum of probability functions, instead uh, rewrite the sum as being a bunch of monotonic functions whose supports are set up to be the Alexandrov open sets in our cover. And while there isn't enough time to tell you this, uh, these monotonic decompositions always exist. That's a theorem. In fact, even more so, there's a greedy algorithm that will construct from, from them from the data. And not only that, there is a unique coarsest such cover. So each of those dialects that we get, or classes, will have the fewest required features. And as a result, the largest Alexandrov open sets in the cover. And to keep us from floating away here, the actual classes in the probabilistic model uh, have support sets. Which, uh, which are contained by the open cover that's subordinate to this coarsest monotonic decomposition, i.e., the actual classes share the same indicator functions. So this means that even though we don't necessarily want to find the original probabilities, we can't find them greedily. We have to do something like expectation maximization. Uh, we can do this greedy search to carve out the support sets, and then 
once we have the support sets, if we really care about the class probabilities, then we can do expectation maximization on them. And that's much faster, and as a result, can handle multiple classes and multiple uh, features as well. OK, so let's pivot back. What does that decomposition do on our CSV data? Well, when we take that CSV data, here are the, the classes that we end up finding. Uh, each of these now, instead of listing the message patterns, I'm just listing the required messages at the, at the root. Uh, and the top few of them are, just as before, Engli English text delimited with commas of various flavors, and they either do or do not have quotes. Uh, and by English text, uh, ASCII UTF-8, ISO 8859, and Windows uh, 1252 are all Engli English text, uh, in fact, actually US English. Uh, interestingly enough, this data set was sourced from Great Britain. Uh, the rest of this are English text delimited with other characters. Very easy to explain. Now, I can also take this methodology, sight unseen, and apply it to PDF data as well. In fact, literally with the same code, just bolt on a different input. If I do that here, uh, we end up with some a very few number of dialects that are actually very easy to understand. Now, by easy to understand, I mean you read the required messages and, and can interpret what they mean. So for instance, uh, the biggest particular collection of files, the biggest dialect for the particular PDF sets that we were, we were looking at uh, on the DARPA SafeDocs project, which are malicious PDF files and non-malicious ones, uh, the vast majority of them basically come down to problems with compressed streams, i.e. PDF files can contain things like images. In fact, the very PDF file that, the, that this slide uh, is, is part of contains a number of compressed streams for the images that you see on the slide. And in fact, there are plenty of malware attacks that target compressed streams. The other interesting thing that tends to happen, and you can kind of see it's a real, very subtle difference in terms of the set of required messages, uh, is, is messing with the delimiters within the PDF file, turning on and off where the, the stream begins and ends. Playing with that allows you to uh, run parsers for the stream off the rails and start uh, activating data payloads that they shouldn't. This is a very common thing that, that malware actors do. So right off the bat, this is saying that, that we have a very clear way to identify these particular kinds of malware. Uh, and the other ones are various, uh, the other dialects that we end up finding are, are various flavors of syntax error. You might say, all right, are syntax errors problems? No, but actually PDF uh, parsers tend to hide syntax errors and try to fix up and continue. And in terms of uh, fixing up and continuing, uh, this is an invitation to various kinds of malevolent behavior. I'll just leave it at that. So in conclusion, uh, this, this monotonically regularized latent uh, class analysis pipeline that I've just shown you uh, helps to classify files. It's largely format agnostic. It's a greedy algorithm, so it runs very fast. Uh, it certainly can work for a variety of formats, not just PDF and CSV. I've used it on, on uh, several other formats as well. Uh, and it works pretty well, provided you have enough features to exploit. And by enough features to exploit, uh, you can kind of tell that because we're looking for coverage. So underlying the success of this method uh, is, in fact, a topological fact about the open cover of the Alexandrov topology of the Dowker complex. Uh, its coarseness governs how well the method works. Now you might say, well, what, what actually should constitute a feature? It's actually kind of amorphous. We've used parsers and messages in this talk, uh, although I've also used traces and system calls. You could well give it some machine learning results, uh, load up some grammar productions, or various other kinds of things. Basically, nothing that I've mentioned in this talk relies on anything besides having a binary relation, i.e., a table that's populated with trues and falses. Because none of this really matters exactly what the contents are if you work statistically and topologically. If you're interested in hearing more about this, certainly drop me a line. Have a look at uh, some of these relevant references. Uh, the, the top paper here uh, contains all of the proofs for uh, the theorems cited in this talk. 
And uh, on my GitHub page, there are indeed several software tools. Uh, and actually, the software tools are outlined in the YouTube video listed here.